sport is the food staple of half the world. How have amateurs affected the design of power tools? Why is there now a big demand for pipe like this? Who tilts Venetian blinds on their sides? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America. Produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. A field of rice ready for harvesting. Here in the U.S., rice has long been a crop of secondary importance. But while we Americans eat on the average only about six or seven pounds of rice a year, to more than one half the world's population, this is far and away the most important food of all. In India, for example, annual rice consumption is 350 pounds per person. To many Chinese, there is no other food except on rare occasions. Sad to think, then, that most of the nutrition contained in rice has for many centuries been washed down the drain in the process of preparing it for the table. But at plants like this one in Houston, the old order changeth in a way that could spell vastly improved health for a billion persons in foreign lands and much greater public enjoyment of rice dishes here at home. lands like an office chair. Why will this substance improve your kitchen? How can driving be improved by a pistol shot? What sort of game is this dog after? Industry on Parade, a brand new by the National Association of Manufacturers. The pogo go off straight up and land in the same vertical position and yet fly horizontally at fighter plane speeds. The huge drafting and design departments take over from... The prototype is constructed because no one has ever flown such a plane before. The pogo is tested inside a hangar, suspended on cables running to the ceiling and to the floor. Now it's time for the real thing. Take off, test flight, and landing. They check and recheck every last working part. The pilot will take off lying on his back. Three years work and a man's life are at stake. Not to mention the role this craft could play in guarding the nation's security. Power is supplied by turboprop rather than straight jet engines. That's because counter-rotating propellers will give better control in those vertical takeoffs and landings. The test pilot is Skeets Coleman. Looks like a foolhardy profession, flying revolutionary new planes like this for the first time. But Skeets has full confidence in the experts who designed it and put it together. On starting, the engines get an assist from a compressor on the ground. The engines are really jet engines, but instead of pushing the plane like a rocket, the power they generate is used to turn the props. Everything is working smoothly, and Skeets is about to take her up. At less than 200 feet, he levels off to assume horizontal flight. These are the fellows who said it could be done. How right they were. Level flight at speeds above 500 miles an hour. The plane noses up, hovers like a hummingbird, and gently lowers itself to the ground. As one humorist at Convair put it, this plane lands like an office. There's a tiny landing circle marked out on the runway, 
and Skeets maneuvers the plane to set it right down on the mark. Not only the Navy, but the Air Force too, and even the Army, are now interested in the amazing plane that can take off or land anywhere and does away with the need for airports. America's new frontiers are pushed back every day somewhere in this country through research. Each year, industry spends two and a half billion dollars in research to discover new products or improve those already on the market. These new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us. But more important, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater chance for better living for everybody. This can happen only in America, where industry is free to experiment, where men know they can refuse to accept limitation, where we have a competitive enterprise system in which nothing is impossible. A young lady whose hobby is ceramics is about to give us a demonstration of a material essential to many branches of industry and essential to many of the products we get from industry. Not the clay out of which she has made this artistic casting, but the glazing compound with which she is now coating it. The heat of her home-sized kill will fire the compound and transform it into an attractive, durable, glossy surface like that on her chinaware, sinks, bathtub, tile walls, range, and refrigerator. Twelve hours later, the glazing is complete. So now, let's go to Baltimore and look in on a plant from which comes the glazing compound she used. Here at the Pemco Corporation, we learn that glaze is used in the making of dinnerware and tile, like the porcelain enamel used on the other industrial products we mentioned, are basically glass, that is, silicon or sand. But they contain a lot of other chemicals as well to help them perform spells, resisting high heat and sudden cold remaining impervious to acids, and so on. The formula is prepared according to the way the batch will be and other considerations. Then the chemicals are carefully weighed out in accordance with a specific recipe of the ceramic engineers and are thoroughly mixed so that all parts of the resulting batch will be uniform throughout. Now the raw materials are melted and hard. The molten glaze pours from the lip of the smelter and immediately drops between two rollers which are cooled by water beside them. This converts the some brittle flakes called frit. Immediately the flakes are broken up into tiny pieces. The shade of the frit has little to do with what it will look like when it shows up finally in the kitchen, bathroom, or as the outer surface of a building. For in the firing that follows the application of porcelain enamel, a delicate green can change to a light pink, or a light pink might become a deep maroon. Here is a clear glaze coming out of the smelter. Glazes for dinnerware or tile are quenched directly in water. As it hits the water, it crystallizes into particles about the size of rock salt. Before it can be used, it must be dried and then milled to much smaller sizes. Drying is accomplished in gas-fired rotary dryers like this. Here's what it looks like inside. Finally, the frit is shipped out to factories in every part of the country. And from those factories, in a few weeks, it will find its way into our homes as the beautifying and protecting surface of some valuable piece of equipment. Here's a problem in traffic safety, being discussed by driving instructor Leonard McKellar of Portland. Where and how to make a right-hand turn? Sounds like the simplest thing in the world for any experienced driver, but experienced drivers are by no means necessarily safe drivers. Leonard travels all through the West as safety supervisor for Pacific Telephone and Telegraph Company, lecturing to and testing the driving practices of employees who use company vehicles. Here's one of the tests, 
These tumblers must remain standing while the car is brought to a smooth stop precisely on an indicated line. Good one. Now the parking test, which is standard in most states' driver exams, but which is judged much more stringently by Mr. McCuller. He takes off points if you so much as touch bumpers with the car ahead or behind. Begun just three years ago, this program has cut the accident rate of company drivers 40%. Some of the tests have powerful educational value. For example, here we find McKellar about to test a man's reaction time. See how long it takes him to respond to danger. At 20 miles an hour, McKellar pulls a string and fires a capsule of paint onto the pavement. When the brake is hit, another shell fires more paint. While the driver was reacting, the car traveled 17 feet 5 inches. After that, it took 16 more feet to stop. Total distance at 20 miles an hour, 33 feet 5 inches. And this is much better than average. Brand new Americans are arriving at a record rate. About 7,000 citizens are added to our population every 24 hours. By 1975, it is estimated we'll have a population of some 220 million persons. These new Americans will need a great many things from babyhood to voting age. Businessmen are planning today for the 10 to 15 million new families we'll have in 1975. It's up to every one of us to help maintain a strong and vigorous enterprise system if we are to fulfill the needs and desires of an ever-growing America. A car full of hunters arrives at Nilo Farms in southern Illinois. They're after both duck and pheasant, and have they come to the right place? Of course, Mr. John M. Olin, the host on today's trip, is well aware of that fact, for he is chairman of the board of Olin Matheson Chemical Corporation, which runs Nilo Farms as a demonstration for farmers and sportsmen of something called controlled shooting. There are kennels on the farm housing some of the finest retrieving dogs anywhere. Also, hundreds of pheasants reared in pens to help replace the millions of game birds exterminated by intensive farming methods that utilize all the land and leave the birds no foraging or nesting areas. Here at Nilo, another sort of farming, strip farming, is practiced, and farmers come from miles around to see how it works. The idea is to leave patches of submarginal land on which the birds can find food and cover. In many cases, this is land not profitably cultivated anyhow. In others, it is land the farmer purposely seeds with the sort of plants that will make it good hunting territory once his other crops have been harvested. Come autumn, he can add to his income by charging hunters a fee because they know the birds are there and because hunting conditions are ideal, birds and hunters all have a fair chance. Use of good retrieving dogs is encouraged to eliminate the chance of wounded birds not being recovered. Flying cripples their call. When the party turns to duck hunting, we see what kind of retrievers these dogs really are. That water's near freezing, but in he goes. You may wonder why a chemical company would be spending money trying to persuade farmers to develop controlled shooting. Part of the reason is that one division of Olin Matheson manufactures firearms and ammunition, and maintaining the supply of game is a form of business insurance. But just as important, John Olin is a sportsman, and he plans to do everything he can to head off the threatened elimination of many of our finest game birds.